Hi, welcome. Um, my name's Gavin Bannerman. I'm the Director of Queensland Memory here at the State Library of Queensland. And I'd like to, in uh, I'd like to um, welcome you to our Fellowship Information Night for 2022. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we're gathering today uh, and acknowledge the um, Elders past, present and emerging. This point of Kuril, the point is a historically important meeting, gathering and sharing place and it's tradition which is we carry um, strongly through our work as uh, custodians of Queensland's documentary heritage. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the fellowship program um, coming up for 2022. Uh, hopefully you're all interested and that's what you're here for. Um, and there'll be a lot of avenue for questions and interaction. One of the main avenues for that interaction, which is new for this event, but we have run for other fellowship talks and things like that, is um, Slido. So Slido is an online platform which you can use to submit questions to your esteemed panel, panel here, who I'll introduce. Um, any question you can answer in text form, uh, there's a character limit on it, but send it through and uh, it'll appear um, for us to read off this screen here. So there's, I just want to reiterate, there's no dumb questions with fellowship questions. It's, you know, everyone has to learn, everyone starts somewhere um, and uh, it should be hopefully a good forum for you to be able to submit your questions. I'd also like to uh, just let everybody know that we are live streaming this event. So there will be, um, there's the equivalent of this number of people pre-booked to watch this online. So um, you can also uh, submit questions through the Slido platform. So welcome to our online um, viewers as well. And also um, for your reference or if you know anybody who couldn't be here today, this session will be recorded and available at a later date for um, people to, to view. Um, have I got, is it possible to get the Slido QR code? I'll just, so um, this used to be a real hassle to get people to use QR codes and libraries were quite early adopters of QR codes. But like one of the benefits of COVID is like, you know, <laughs> we're not we're not going to be um, giving your data to anybody. So this is um, stays in the room. Is that possible to get that up? Yeah, cool. Um, so if you just follow that link, um, it'll bring you to a Slido um, page, and you can submit that as um, yeah, as an anonymous person <laughs> or a, a named person. So. <laughs> Um, and so we'll endeavour to get through those, th you know, as um, through the course of the evening. So if there's anything that pops in your mind and you're like, oh, I really want to ask that, um, that'll come through on the uh, on the screen before us. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to play a little bit of an interview. Um, for the 2022 program, we have developed a series of videos which tell a little bit of a story about the fellowship program at State Library. It can be a bit of an unusual thing if you haven't done a fellowship before, if you've not been exposed to it, just to know what it is a fellowship, like how do I do this? You might be interested in doing research, but you know, what is a fellowship? Is this some secret society that I'm opting to join into? Um, it's not that, it's all kosher, but um, we have got a series of videos which are all available, will be available through social media and the website to um, give you a little bit of an orientation. So I'd like to introduce one of our videos which talks about tips and tricks from previous uh, fellows. State Library's research fellowships are really important because they're all about creating new knowledge and sharing that knowledge with the world. The library is this magical, wonderful repository of incredible things. If people don't come in and pull those things out and see what can be done from those, it's just such a shame. Who should apply? That's a good question. <laughs> if you're a gifted storyteller or you're creative or you've got something new or exciting to say about Queensland's past, present or future, it's really worth considering applying. Everybody has stories to tell, everybody has a love of this place. It's up to you in terms of where you want to take the research fellowship and the scope is wide open. Yeah, you definitely don't have to be an academic. Describe the application process. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. 
There's an online form, pitch it to the board, identify as many specific materials from the State Library collections that will be relevant for your work. Nobody knows your project like you do. You've really got to sell what your passion is about this thing because that's what people um, read when they read any kind of application. What tips do I have for searching for collections? Um, okay. Make friends with the staff at the State Library of Queensland. I found the online searching really useful. I could work at home, I could book things from home and then come in and pick them up. Once you start to talk about your project, they can actually point you in the right direction. If you're still a little bit unsure about your project or how to go about applying, make sure you attend the Fellowship Information Night for a lot of really specific information to help you get started. The more people apply, the, the more broader the range of ideas. Find what's here and work with it and make those stories accessible to the general community. We're really keen to work with fellowships to extend that work as well and tell more and more stories. Okay, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Hopefully that gives you a bit of an overview of um, you know, the breadth of fellowship opportunities and a bit of a taste or maybe prompted some of those questions which um, will emerge during tonight's proceedings. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, our panel um, who are here today who represent a breadth of experiences and backgrounds to answer some of your questions. I'd like to introduce John uh, Pacini first. Um, he's a lecturer at History at Australian Catholic University where he, f where he focuses on Australian politics and culture read through a global prism. His most recent book is Human Rights in the 20th Century Australia, published by Cambridge University Press, and he's been a judge uh, of the Queensland Memory Award since 2019. Deb Anderson is a journalist and academic. Her research at Monash University draws from oral history, journalism and ecofeminism to explore the lived experience of extreme weather. Deb is the co-recipient of the 2020 John Oxley Library Fellowship with Kerry Foxwell Norton for their project Women of the Great Barrier Reef, the untold stories of environmental conservation in Queensland. Mark Lauk is an academic uh, with a background in public sector ethics and accountability. Most of Mark's current research focuses on outlaw motorcycle gangs. He's the former host of the New Books in Terrorism and Organised Crime podcast. Mark is the 2021 John Oxley Library Honorary Fellow for his project Social Networks of Crime and Corruption, The First and Second Jokes. And last but not least, Robin Hamilton is lead collection building in Queensland memory here at the State Library of Queensland. Robin and her team source, select, commission and acquire content both old and new in order to build a representative documentary record of Queensland and its people. Robin has a background in music librarianship and World War I collections through the QANZAC 100 project that went for four years from 2014 to 2018. So, esteemed, incredible background of people who have um, done research projects, overseen research projects and collected the outcomes of research projects. Um, I'll kick it off with a few questions, but please, through the link, submit anything that um, comes to mind. Um, just probably a note as well, um, if there is a need to say <laughs> say anything to our um, audience, we've got a mi roving microphone that we'll make available. It's just important that if you speak, um, we can pick it up on a microphone so it will come through the recording for our off-site um, viewers. Um, so we had a, an event which we do with um, fellows towards the end of their fellowship program called Research Reveals. And we did one yesterday with um, Deb and Kerry um, to talk about their project, um, Women of the Great Barrier Reef. And I suppose because it's so fresh in our memories, um, just last night we were sitting in these same chairs um, and uh, Deb and Kerry were talking about the outcomes of their research, the people that they were interviewing. But I suppose with that very um, kind of present in our memory, do you want to just talk a little bit about how it felt to talk about the outcomes and kind of realise that research phase of your project? Yeah. Um, thanks, Gavin. Um, the first thing I'd say is that it's been an absolute pleasure to work on this project with the State Library. Um, and I would strongly encourage any of you who is thinking of applying for a fellowship to do so. Um, for us, um, it helped, oh, it's, it's gone off in different directions in part 
In part because of the context in which we received our fellowship um, in 2020. Um, prevented travel restrictions, um, uh, all kinds of things seem to have gone down between then and now, including you know the recent floods. So there was a time there when it felt like we were never going to get into the library. Um, but it led our direction, it led our research in different directions. So we went actually out um, into the field. Hi Kerry, she's just coming to the back. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, to, and started talking to women. So started the oral history phase of our research first. And originally we had intended to come into the library and work with the collections that we had identified first. So we'd go within the library first. It seemed the most logical place to start. There's some terrific holdings here. For example, with respect to the Great Barrier Reef Committee and its formation, the Queensland Literal Society, we could identify very clearly that there were sites where these women had had you know, a, a significant influence. And so we'd be able to um, start piecing together some of their stories. Um, and so we could, we could already imagine from that, okay, so we might be able to record some of the stories with the women um, who uh, are still, you know, still active in those spaces. We'll be able to, you know, we could think of a kind of publication outcomes that we wanted to create. We could think of the uh, kind of podcast, oral, uh, oral history side of those outcomes. But I think something else has come from the way that we've ended up doing the project, which is that formation of, I think, a connection, like a community of women. And that's what I think presenting last night, we tried to convey, and Kerry, I think you did a great job of conveying that sense of relationship that you end up building um, through doing, doing this kind of research um, through the library. Um, I didn't expect that outcome quite so soon and to sit here last night, to be kind of up here and talking about that, to have realised that aspect of the project felt really rewarding. Even if we don't yet hold that book in our hands with um, all of the women's stories in it and we don't have that podcast you know, yet um, or the completed oral history collection, so yes. Um, I will just n nip a question off, um, or answer a question um, that's come up just about um, is there a chance that a pair um, could share one fellowship to research together? The answer is absolutely yes, and Kerry and Deborah are a great example of that and how complementary skills and backgrounds can, can work together to do that. But we do have um, a history of two people, um, Louise Martin Chu. And Matthew Wenger um, applied and were John Oxley Library Fellows in 2019, um, looking at the history of the Queensland Government Printing Office. So yes, yep, there, there is. It is possible if you've got a, a collaborator that you want to um, do that with. Um, the bursary stays the same amount. We don't double it. You don't get two, yeah, you <laughs> two have to lots. Share the money. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is that is definitely possible. Um, Mark, you're looking at an area, uh, when you talk about the subject area of your project, everyone gets a little bit excited and, you know, it's like, ooh, motorcycle gangs, ooh, outlaws. Um, <laughs> and you're obviously navigating um, a project where you do have to be careful about sensitivities, privacy, and discreet in that information you manage. Did you want to talk a little bit about how, you know, when you're forming up your project, how you have to think about those kinds of things? Sure. Um, so for those who don't know, I've actually got access to the Phil Dickey collections. Phil, Phil Dickey was one of the journalists who did a lot of the work that led up to the Fitzgerald inquiry. And he has put all of his papers and all of his notes into the collection, into closed collection. So there's, there's documents in that collection that are labelled secret. Um, so there's multiple levels of consideration I have to give. We have all the normal ethical things that you would have when you're talking to other people, which I'm not doing. I fortunately am dealing with the dead. So it just cuts out one level of ethics for me. But I still have to be sensitive to what, you know, people have relatives, people have children, people are alive, and I, I have to be careful about what I, if I'm making allegations. Um, but my other level of sensitivity is I can't just use anything that's in the collection. Um, one of the benchmarks I've got is fortunately a whole lot of journalists out there again who've also been given access and have published a lot of the material in these documents. So they're in the public domain. But you know, a rule that I've given myself is if something is not in the public domain, I'm not going to be the one who puts it there. 
certainly not through the process of this fellowship. Um, there's also handwritten notes and I'm extremely cautious about anything I'm going to use from there because I wouldn't want to... His handwritten notes are literally his stream of consciousness at times. Some of it's legible, so it's actually usable, but for the you know, when I can read it, I've still got to be extremely cautious about what he's saying. Um, he has a coding... So the, this is Phil Dickey, he has a coding system of about people he used. So, yes, you're going to have access to um, material that you have to use a lot of discretion over, Fortunately for me and for three of us on the panel, if I was going to use it in the public domain, I have to go through a university ethics process anyhow. So I have that safety valve that I would have to use. Um, if you were not in a university, I'm sure that the staff are more than capable of discussing a lot of these ethics issues with you or other fellows are or uh, past fellows as well. Uh, but you should always be extremely cautious that other people are going to read this and other people have feelings too, if nothing else. But you could also end up making allegations that could cause strife in the community or strife for individuals. Um, that, that, I think that's an interesting kind of reflection about that sensitivity and care, kind of, you know, with the collections that, you know, dealing with stories that are still yet to be played out is exciting but also comes with responsibility. So I think... Mm. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, John, you're a researcher yourself, but you've also sat on the other side of the, <laughs> of the um, table and have um, been on the judging panels. Mm. Do you want to talk a little bit about that process of when you're getting... It's a little bit like Christmas when you get the applications in. It's quite exciting. Um, that, <laughs> that process, you know, of, of, and what you're kind of looking for, what stands out for you as a, as a panellist? Sure. Thanks, Gavin. I mean... Well, yeah, it is a bit a bit like Christmas if you get your presents via Dropbox. <laughs> um, and, yeah, so, I mean, you... And I and I go in and I have a look. It's usually, you know, like, depending on how many, sometimes the John Oxley Award will get, like, how many dozens of applications, while others only get three or four. So you can be strategic, kind of think about which applica which sort of how many you're going to be applying for, potentially. Um, but yeah, what we what we do is we receive them all in our drop boxes and we have to read through them more carefully and we have like a grading sheet, right? Where we have to actually go through all the selection criteria, which is a really important thing to think about when you are applying for a job, applying for a fellowship. Make sure that you read what they want, you know? Make sure that you read all of that. You just kind of go in and go, I've got a great idea. You know, I'm really, I love this collection. I'm going to go look at this collection. I'm going to tell them all about why this is going to be really interesting. You've got to read the selection criteria because that's what we are grading you on, right? That's what we, that's what, as a judging panel, that's what we're going to do. We need to read it. We can only judge you based on the criteria that are in front of us. So that's how we do it. Um, and what do I, what am I really looking for? I mean, you know, this is going to be, the good thing is that Gavin's always very careful to ensure that there's good disciplinary spread. So like I'm a historian, so I'm going to be brought in by something that's obviously got a bit of historical bent to it. Well, if it's maybe literary, visual art, or other culture, I might be interested in it, but I'm not going to understand it at the deep level. You know, this required for me to really be like, ah, oh, yes, this is really great. But you know, is what I'm looking for is you know something that is novel, something that's got you know a, a real pull, and you can just read it, and you're just like, yes, I can really work. I can see how that would work. You know, it needs to be kind of relevant and interesting in the subject matter as well. Yeah. The subject matter is important, but also conceptually, what are they doing with that stuff? What are they doing with the what's what's this? What's the applicant going to do with say you know these um, this particular archive? Are they going to do something we haven't thought about before? Like I love the idea of um, of, of of mapping the sites of the joke and so it's social it's social media. You could do it in Google Google Maps. Like I just love to see. Oh well, I can actually access this. I can see how this would work. I can access this. I can go and I can see. Well, where were all the different drop off points for this money? You know, where were where was it centralized? You know, where who were the key players and where were they in Brisbane? Because that is that I can really see that that taking place. I can see mm. that. So it is about kind of those mixture of you know the project strength in and of itself and the kind of content, but also yeah the the deliverable. What is the deliverable? Because it is important, right? And this mm -hmm. is what you know. Gavin <laughs> reminds us. You know, in our meetings, is you know, it needs to be about not just how is it interesting, but what are you going to deliver? What the library is going to want, and that is going to really um, bring that Queensland history, bring those Queensland um, knowledges out into the public domain in accessible ways. Mm. Mm. 
Thanks, John. Um, uh, in terms of things that we may want, um, there's lots of things I want, but um, <laughs> there's one of those things that can be an outcome of um, a project is uh, addition and growth of the State Library's collection. So, um, you know, hopefully there's an opportunity to collect the oral histories that Deb and Kerry are recording um, mm. uh, with, the, with the contributors. Um, but probably talking about what we actually want for our collection, Robin, you're better placed. Um, to maybe talk a little bit. Do you want to talk? You've got a, the, you've got a great job and job title of like yeah. lead collection building. Do you want to, What is collection building? So, well, it's acquisition mostly. So it's intentionally collecting, looking about and uh, collecting and sourcing and selecting and acquiring a representative documentary record of the history of Queensland and its people. Broad brief um, and our intent, it has to be intentional collecting, so not just sort of passive or accidental. Um, and <coughs> it's the whole of Queensland, so that is not just maybe the narratives we grew up with, it's it's going beyond the that this, that I, I guess the, the, the white male colonial basis of really our collection, yeah. Yeah. which yeah, is how it started, which is how I most mean, collections it started. Like that. And, like and, that. And, and, and stepping into other narratives and other perspectives, um, other resources, other communities. Uh, so uh, we collect old stuff and new stuff. Um, we collect... Um, antiquarian material, so we scour the market for Queensland related antiquarian material, but we also commission new things. For instance, we've just uh, engaged a few photographers to capture images of Election Day in Queensland in 100 years time. Someone will say, what was it like in 2022 election, in federal election in Queensland? And we'll, we'll have a representative sample of images to and other ephemeral bits and pieces to, to give them a, a sense of that. Um, mm. um, yes, that, that's collection building. It's great fun. Um, but in terms of what you're, how it relates to what you're doing, as they are saying, uh, there are sometimes collection outcomes for, uh, for us from fellowships, and they can be things like oral histories, uh, which you... you find or or do along the way uh, but it can be just other collection material from the people you're engaging with mm. so a, a whole new for uh, one of the people in the video you saw was Tony Risson who did uh, a project about Greek cafes the evolution of Greek cafes all over Queensland um, and uh, she sort of tracked uh, Greek um, communities growing through Queensland through the prism of Greek cafes. And as a result, we now have quite a lovely selection of collections related to Greek cafes. And they, they've come from the families with whom she engaged through her research. Yeah. I think it's, um, it's a really interesting opportunity for a lot of fellowships because um, applicants often bring with them a community or they've worked with a community. like. Mm with Tony working with the Greek community, um, John Willsteed, who's also featured in the, um, in the video, you know, brought himself a community of um, poster makers and designers and graphic artists in the music scene in the um, kind of 80s and in Brisbane. So th those, a lot of those posters found a way into our collection as a result of his research. So there's different, there's different ways of kind of having that collection outcome, which is, you know, is, is but one thing that can um, be a positive outcome of your research project. Um, is there anything, I was probably, I'll ask you, uh, and I think everyone is like, that's really nice to hear about, you know, topics and this, but it's like, tell me about what it's like to do a fellowship. Give me some tips, like what, how do you, how do you structure your day? How do you do it? How do you attack it? Um, do you have any kind of personal reflections um, Deb, on how, how to best um, approach a fellowship, whether it be, how about the application process? Because 
I hope you don't mind me saying, but you were you resubmitted an application, so you, you were submitted once, were unsuccessful, and then resubmitted. Yeah. So, do you want to talk a little bit about that process? Sure. Um, and I think it's a great opportunity when you submit an application and it comes back. It's that's the perfect opportunity then to go in and say, okay, so what else do we need to be doing here? So what's missing? What? How can we build on this? How can we make it um, fit the criteria? Um, which is what we did and uh, so we we actually came into the library um, and met with some of the library staff. Um, Chrissy Theodosio had a um, meeting with us, a memorable meeting with us Kerry um, and you know we got to talk to her about okay so what do we need in our application and she was very clear in identifying so don't just talk about you know there are five or six or a dozen, half a dozen collections, you know, be very specific. And if you're going to focus on women of the reef, choose three, didn't she say she had three, find three or, or, or two, and then show us what you might do with those, with those particular women's stories. So it's um, that level of specificity we hadn't included in the first application. So it was very clear to us what we needed to do and so we came and spent a little bit more time kind of, excuse me, kind of thinking through a couple of the women's stories. Um, Isabel Bennett, very well known marine biologist, and um, Patricia Mather, um, who'd been um, with Queensland Museum for some time. And so we were able to identify two very prominent women um, whose names were <laughs> clearly um, influential in different domains in the library's holdings and we built her application around that um, and then uh, later when we were awarded our fellowship I mean I spent a lot of time in lockdown in Melbourne um, Kerry is based in uh, uh, the Gold Coast um, well kind of northern New South Wales um, and so similarly got caught with travel restrictions, border restrictions, so we actually didn't get to do the project that we wanted to, but because we'd mapped out the kind of outcomes we were looking for, I think the, the library have been just nothing but supportive to us. Um, and uh, it, 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 the fact that we haven't followed that original plan, um, it, 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 it honestly, um, uh, if anything, it made us feel more supported during that time because um, when we reached out and felt, okay, kind of guilty that we haven't yet been able to get into the collections, um, we were just encouraged to do what we can do and to do it well. And so we began building the oral history collection instead. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Um, that probably touches on a little bit um, of a question which is in the, um, in the thread of um, you, how you make reference to collections that you might be considering. And I would just recommend to be specific as possible and like if you use what's called the identifier it's like the unique number of a collection we love that because it shows you've kind of taken the time to look in the catalogue and and point to something specifically um you know people can say people will often say oh yes i'll use the state library's collections including their trove newspapers and it's like those are something that we hold in the collection and are valuable but they're not that unique they're not um, something which you can get in only one place you know they are a resource which are available in lots of different ways so it's like what's the what's the unique thing that we have that you need to unlock your history mm -hmm. so in terms of um, probably another question I'm just trying to try to knock off as many questions in one response as I can but um, in to elaborate on what sort of engagement we're looking for with the John Oxley collection. And I'll probably just be clear as well, different fellowship categories have different ways of engaging with the collection. Um, the Letty Katz um, fellowship, for example, is really through the prism of music um, that you look at the John Oxley Library collection, whereas something like the Middlehauser Scholar in Residence um, is in reference to collections like the John Oxley Library collection, but it's also looking at distributed collections across Queensland and how um, the galleries, libraries, archives and museum sector can work to manage that shared collective memory. So, but for the John Oxley Library Fellowship, you need to demonstrate how you're going to use unique collections in the John Oxley Library 
to further something that you want to do. So, and that might be um, also growing that that collection. Mm. That can that can be another outcome as well. Um, I was probably going to talk just a little bit now, um, just very prosaic sorts of things, but things that come up in research and the act of researching. Um, things like uh, John and Mark, this is probably questions for you. Is like. Um, just going through recursive writing, getting used to reading that again, opening books, the physicality, like what is it like to do this research, to kind of do do that kind of like detective work to, uh, for want of a better word, to, mm. <laughs> to, find, um, to find those things that will further your project. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I get in my documents, they come in plastic boxes and then they're all individually sheathed. So each document is separate and they're all numbered. So I actually made a spreadsheet of all the ones I wanted. Um, no one had actually done an electronic list of all the things that were in the collection. So my first contribution to the library was I made a spreadsheet and gave it to the library. But I've been using that spreadsheet ever since and I then order a particular box that I know I'm going to need and gets rotated. I think the number one thing I want to talk about though in working here in the library is this is my happy place every week. I've got no way I can over exaggerate that. The rest of the world disappears for the whole time you're in the library doing this research on this topic and um, you're pulling out your documentation. I'm like going through interviews with particular people from the Fitzgerald Inquiry. I'm happily typing away, turning the pages and then my alarm will go off on my laptop and I've got to go and go, oh. It literally, the time disappears. You're lost in this brand new little world. And obviously mine's all documentary work, but there's a whole lot of other physical things people work with. There are 1,500 t Queensland tea towels here in this library. Would you believe that? <laughs> so Upcoming exhibition, stay yes. tuned. <laughs> um, Very good. So I, I just really can't overemphasize how great it is you finally get a hold of this information you've always thought about and you just get lost in it. And the staff are fantastic. Mm. The staff are wonderful. This is a building full of history nerds who just want other history nerds to come in and do history with them and come up with new ideas. So Tamara was in the booth and we were talking about mapping and she said, oh, I can find photos of all the original buildings. Oh, oh great, yes, let's do that. And you just build and you get ideas. <coughs> Um, on the, the video they said, how do you do research, make friends with the staff? Absolutely number one rule. Mm -hmm. um, do you want yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, yeah, I can only echo that sentiment of the joy of, of archival research where you, um, you know, the, the, the way you start, of course, is with the, with the finding aids. Unfortunately, there wasn't an existing finding aid, but many collections do have finding aids and I can't recommend enough it's all well and good to say, yes, like I'm going to look at, you know, the, you know, because I was looking at it yesterday, the Friends of the Earth collection here, which is, you know, has some interesting kind of holdings. Um, but, you know, you can say, yeah, I'm going to look at that collection. It's like, okay, you can say that. But what about if you go into the finding aid, you can actually see exactly what's in each box. It can tell you, like, what is in each box. So you can know, oh, well, I'm going to go, and we're going to just look at that. I'm going to look at what's in this box. You know, you can pull that. This is what, what Gavin was saying. You know, you've got to have a level of specificity about what you're actually going to look at in those. I mean, I've made this mistake in the past in applications, in library applications. We go, I'm going to look at all of these different things. <laughs> I'm going to do everything. <laughs> Overpromising is a real problem. You've got to kind of focus and be narrow. And uh, uh, I think the, the sentiment expressed before is really important there. But yeah, once you actually get into the archive, once you're actually getting in and you're going through the papers, you do you do fall into that into that world where you are like very much as a detective. You're kind of f flicking through. Eventually, you get better at discerning. You know, is this valuable or is this not mm. valuable? My my general rule, and this is, is you know that handwritten stuff doesn't tend to be. I don't tend to value view it with the same importance as, as typed documents mm. because of, from the way that I the sort of archives that I tend to deal with. But if it is legible, then it is sometimes worth definitely having a read of that of that, of that sort of yeah. material because it, it, it can give you, yeah, when you, when you come at the archive, you, you've got to think about that the archive is assembled in a particular way. It's assembled um, by the person who created the archive or the organization that created the archive and they're already choosing what goes in there, right? You know, so then a lot of the time they don't just dump everything in, you know, they, yeah. they're careful about what's in there. So pay attention to how they've organized it. Yeah. and. Um, yeah. Could I just add to that too? Um, when I was saying that your day disappears, your year disappears. 
extremely fast mm. as well. Yes. So mm. when we're talking about scope and over-promising, yeah. what you think you can do in a year, yeah. you should probably cut it to a third mm. at least. Um, this is not an unusual thing. This is normal for everybody. Mm. So your time will just go so fast. Mm. It's probably um, an important point to make that we the, a lot of the fellowships are 12 months um, and you might say that you want to uh, write a screenplay or publish a book. There's not an expectation that that book's published within the 12 months. Mm. What the fellowships are is an opportunity to give you time to investigate the collection and do the research component of your project. And then the writing, publication, filming, production, whatever it is, phases, they may be second phases after that 12 month period. So there's not an expectation that you um, have to do all of these outcomes within the 12 months. It, it, it's about supporting you in that research phase for, for those 12 months. Um, Robin, we've got a new fellowship opportunity this year that's quite exciting. Um, we do. Did you want to talk a bit about the Christina Bowden sure. fellowship? Sure. Uh, so in 2020, we were donated a large archive um, from the Bowden family. So for those of you who may not be familiar with uh, the Bowden family, you might have come across one or two of them. Um, Robert Bowden uh, is in his 90s now, but he has held many roles of musical esteem in Brisbane and Queensland. Um, he was the, Saint, the the organist at St John's for many years and choir master. He was the, uh, the Brisbane City organist at City Hall. He was the Queensland University, University of Queensland organist and he was a senior lecturer at the University of Queensland. Christina Bowden um, had quite a national career as a concert pianist before she even met Robert um, in the late 40s, early 50s. She travelled Australia as the, uh, as the accompanist for the Mobile Quest, which I think was the 1950s version of, um, I, I guess, The Voice or um, <laughs> something like that. Uh, or, or, yeah, and she, she, once she had a family, she became a professional accompanist and probably quietly steered a whole lot of our current and just past generation of classical musicians in Queensland into professional careers. So she also produced many, many concerts over a couple of decades at the Brisbane City, uh, at City Hall. Very accomplished musical couple and the archive is uh, sort of a whole of career, whole of life archive for both of them. And the Bowden family were keen to uh, give researchers the opportunity to investigate Queensland's music history with the, the, this collection as a basis. Um, and a, in, in particular, they, they were keen to um, investigate the, uh, the, the role of women in the evolution of, of music in Queensland. You'll see from the archive that it's, there's a lot of Robert and a little bit of Christine, and that's a very common story it's you know his career was more international um, hers was national but um, mm. she was a woman of her time in some ways and um, a, and not a woman of her time in other ways so uh, the collection's got plenty to offer mm. and so do lots of our other music collections here in the John Oxley Library thanks Robin um, all right we might power through these questions so Keep them coming, and um, I'll open the questions up to the panel if if um, if they're applicable. Some of them, <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, that one's for me. Um, so, <laughs> the first one is, what type of referees are you looking for? Um, people who can talk on our experience in the area of research, or people who can talk on our ability to research. I think. Um, it's <laughs> and, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think we're looking for. I mean, it's a little bit like a job interview where it's somebody who we are looking at um, the the probability and the likelihood of the, what you say you're going to do getting done. And if you have somebody who has 
um, experience on probably your ability to research is probably a little bit more of the focus there because you're somebody you're saying you know this person has said they're going to make a podcast they're going to do this and it's like has this person ever recorded audio before or not like so if this person is going to say um you know i have a long experience working with this person to produce highly engaging um audio scripted audio um, that that will help and strengthen your application. If you have somebody who says, this, is a, this person is really lovely, they're great to work with, it's nice, but a, it's a bit like the identifier kind of reference thing. If you can be as specific as possible and how does, how does that, what that person says in terms of your ability to do the project, how does that support your, a demonstra- it's a demonstrated ability to support that project. So. It's probably more the ability. Um, the video, next question, and thank you for these questions. And yeah. thank you for your votes as well. It's quite helpful to see what resonates with people. Um, do you want me to do that one? Yeah, you can do that one. Sure. Um, outcomes, uh, your, your area of research and your outcomes could be, um, oh, sorry, the question is, the video mentioned creatives should apply. Uh, could they medium this story is told through told in through research be fictional could it be fictional or even film or television screenplays so your research and your outcome could be entirely creative um, a couple of our q anzac 100 fellows one was a playwright so her outcome was a script and another was a folk singer and his outcome was songs and he mined uh, he mined um politics in World War I in order to come up with a series of folk songs. Uh, that was his fellowship. Uh, so, absolutely. Uh, we've had another who was an artist uh, whose, whose outcomes were paintings. Mm-hmm. And I, I suppose the, it's about using dem- that demonstration of the collection informing that yes. creative practice. Yes. So, you know, that's the, that's the trick. We, you, we can't just create anything in a vacuum that that reference back to the collection is a is a big thing uh, but thank you for using ellipses in that um in that uh, it's really i do like an ellipses in a question um so the next question i know i i love these questions because they're real practical and they show what people are thinking about in terms of doing a fellowship and it, it pops up every year people are like i work um how do you balance this? Is this is this going to work for me and my um, and my commitments? So the question is: Can the prior fellows indicate their time allocation to the research, i.e., were you working, family life, etc.? How do you how do you balance all of this? Um, I can certainly yeah. speak for myself. Um, I had imagined spending quite a lot more time in the library in kind of concentrated bursts, um, which wasn't unfortunately due to the pandemic um, an option for us in the end but we certainly will be doing that in future so for us it's become kind of concentrated field work trips where we go up north we've done two field work trips so far we've got another one planned for mid-year um, and so both Kerry and I um, as academics um, we incorporate a lot of the preparation for that research also the writing around that research into our you know into our day jobs um, I have a four-year-old. Uh, we took him on field work with us uh, when we went up north and we will continue to do that. Um, uh, along with his grandmother came along as well, so there was a bit of a crew um, to make that happen, um, which was quite lovely. Um, thank you, Kerry, <laughs> for your generosity with that. Um, but I guess, you know, I, I could imagine that it would take quite different forms depending on what factors you have in your life really and it's just about making it happen for you I mean what was it like for you Mark? Uh, I've been coming in one day a week I was coming in two days a week originally but I'm also a full-time academic so in one way that's a benefit because I'm doing research so I'm actually doing part of my job Um, but the amount of work I was doing in my job kept growing and growing COVID caused all sorts of issues at work as well so um, I'm currently doing one day a week but the important thing I want to say is, when I'm here, I'm just gathering information out of the files. I'm doing a lot of the actual work work outside of the library in other time, in my own time. Um, and uh, 
somebody mentioned Trove before. I am using Trove as another resource to support what I'm getting from the library. And I'm not doing, I'm not spending my library time on anything other than the collection. So it's about allocating your time really well. So um, once again, coming back to the theme, I keep saying your time will disappear. So use it as wisely as you can. So use your time in the library for library purposes. As, as part of the fellowship, um, you get access to the um, research lounge on level four. So it's a, um, you, you, get, you get one of these and you get to come back of house. So um, some people use it differently. So Henry, who you might've seen on the video as well, he's based in Melbourne, has family in Brisbane and comes up and does kind of week long sort of stints to get his stuff and he goes back and does research. So you can be an interstate applicant, so I encourage people who aren't in the Sunshine State to apply as well. And we've had lots of people structure their, their work in that way. Um, and some people, you know, if you're working full time, we you can come into the library on the weekend and we open, you know, late. So people often ask, can I do my fellowship on the weekend? Yes, yep, you can definitely come in on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And also, um, yeah, which is, like, so there's a flexibility to that. And then also, um, some people may want to come in once a week. Some people, you know, we've had, they come in five days a week because they've got access to things and it, it works well for their project and it becomes something where they can structure, it, the structure works for them, that they've, you've got access to, you know, Wi-Fi and you've got access to all these sorts of things. Um, it just depends on what your circumstances are and what your structure, you know, suits you. Okay. I'll get through these questions. Um, if you want to apply for both the John Oxley and the Letty Cats with a view to getting one of the one of the other, um, do you put in two separate Smarty Grants applications or one? I can, I can answer this. So it's one as a drop down box where you can tick it so you don't have to redo it all. Um, the only thing is if they're different applications, so if you're wanting to put a different topic for two categories, you have to submit a different application. But if it's the same wording, the same application, there's just a tick box where you say, put it in these in these categories. Um, if you have a community, so, sorry, I keep, I should put quotation marks. Um, so a question here is, if you have a community related to your area, should you reference the community and perhaps show links or examples? I might throw that to you, um, John, just because, you know, from a sort of assessor, you know, selection panelist, um, yeah, how that sort of reflecting that prior work with the community, how, how, is, how do you see that? Mm. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it is, it, is, it is important if you can bring in something into the library as well, like as you were saying, so it's mm. about those collections and you want to, want to grow those collections. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the idea of community could also be read quite quite widely. Like I'm thinking here about, you know, when I did research about like 1960s and 1970s radicals in Brisbane, there's just a whole bunch of archival material sitting in people's garages that hopefully hasn't been washed away <laughs> in a flood recently or something else. But this is what happens, you know, so often mm. when you're doing this kind of research and you're reaching out to these sort of communities, you often can't find this 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 material, and often it's just in the most precariously stored situations. <laughs> and as a historian, you just kind of get very stressed out <laughs> looking at it. It's like, oh my god, can you please, <laughs> can you please um, store this properly? So definitely, reading community isn't necessarily like a uh, like your particular kind of community of ethnic origin potentially. But it could be much wider than that. It could be, you know, political uh, communities. It could be any 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 community sort of writ large so don't so don't, don't think that it's excluded or that there's any kind of that, you know there'll be a preference for you know if you can bring in some like you know substantial you know greek or italian history archive it could be something uh something quite distinctive as well um uh, this question has just popped up which is another yeah. most popular one gavin yeah it is <laughs> it is you're getting flamed um so all panelists um is the observation that all the panelists today uh, our academics have non-academics been fellowship recipients in the past and that uh, I suppose speaking to that just very generally it's something that we're conscious of that there are 
funding opportunities for people in the academic world to have research funded. You know, there's Australian yeah. Research Council and there are opportunities for that. So we're very conscious, you know, the total cumulative value, I think, of the fellowships is about $85,000, which, you know, in terms of federally funded Australian yeah. Research Council, is like, it's a tiny amount. So yeah. we, we try and use that money really effectively to see where it can be make the biggest difference. So um, we are very conscious of supporting non, um, non-academic or people who don't operate within an envir- university system because often they operate in a way where they're trying to cobble together a Helen, T- Helen Taylor res- um, you know, grant from Brisbane City Council, um, the National Library Community Heritage Grant, you know, they're trying to piece together a few, you know, they might have got RADF money or they've got these little pockets of money that they're trying to get to this outcome that they're trying to trying to achieve. So um, in short answer is no, you definitely don't need to be an, an academic. Um, I think people um, from an academic background have been successful because they're engaged in the discourse of Queensland history, but that's the main thing. You have to be engaged with Queensland history. You don't have to be an academic. and. I mean, I, I love what academic people provide and their applications are always, you know, because they're used to writing applications. But I think sometimes the charm and sometimes that left of kind of centre thinking sometimes is, you know, like, you know, Tony Risson is not um, aligned to a university. So she was like, had this, you know, observation that Greek cafes were like the McDonald's, the, the proto McDonald's because they brought fast food that could be easily replicatable and every town, even though they weren't franchised, if you saw Greek cafe, you instantly knew what the food offer would be. Mm. So she she kind of had this observation and she worked deeply with the Greek community to look at Greek cafes and she had the initiative to do that herself. And she's published, she's self-published books and um, done an exhibition at the State Library. So yeah, hopefully, um, the mess, hopefully people who aren't in the academic realm aren't, um, uh, ho- hopefully they are encouraged mm-hmm. to apply because it's mm-hmm. definitely a sector which we want to work closely with and also um, I just want to make the point that um, even if you are unsuccessful in a fellowship there are other ways of working with you to support the project or research you want to do mm-hmm. and um, hopefully everybody here has requested something out from the John Oxley Library in the past but it's something that people aren't immediately aware of that anybody can walk off the street go to the catalogue or go to the reference desk and say I want to have a look at this thing in the collection and somebody will go and retrieve it out of our repository in the other side of the building and bring it for you to have a look at and you can't do that in a museum it's very hard to do that in an art gallery but in libraries such as ours you you are able to basically request within you know there's a few rare and restricted sorts of things but you can pretty much request anything from our collection and look at it in the reading room mm. maybe can i say as well that it's about the fellowship you're applying for so if i'm judging the middle house of one we'll often get maybe we, we, probably the majority of what we get would be non-academics yeah, yeah. Who, are, who are submitting to that so well the john oxley is obviously more tailored to you know historians and, and academics and people who have that kind of background some of the other ones are obviously much more tailored at professionals within the glam sector, for instance, who would not be potentially full-time academics. Yeah. The playwright wasn't an academic. The folk singer wasn't an academic. Mm. Great fellowships, mm. great outcomes. You, you, you don't want an academic involved anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Too much trouble. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Hard to keep them to time. <laughs> um, I would also encourage you to look at the, the um, Queensland Memory Awards webpages have previous fellows and we've often done um, video short videos with people talking about their projects and also gives a pricey of their research projects so that is a helpful way of um, kind of seeing what the the lay of the land has been Um, I'll read out the question but I might get you to ask this Um, this isn't a quiz Robin but um, can you tell us the relationship between state library and state archives Um, if project materials sit at state archives is the library able to help me unlock the archives so we're different institutions but our collections are very complementary so state archives holds government records um, so the internal documents of government departments essentially through time in a nutshell uh, all the way through time so it's got some very very old records uh, and 
state library tends to hold kind of everything else. Uh, so non-government records, so uh, for other organisations, whether they be um, community or corporate, and, and then personal archives of individuals. Uh, so you can see how sometimes those collections would be really useful side by side, depending on your topic. Um, and we can help you unlock the state archives records a bit, but there are some also very helpful um, archivists out at state archives who can do that too. Uh, I have to say our collections are, uh, there's, sometimes their collections are not quite as accessible overall as ours are. Uh, they haven't quite, they don't quite have the digitisation program we have either. But, uh, but, but with their help, you can really deep mine what they've got. Um, and like archivists and librarians, I have to say, are by nature organised hoarders. I think that would be a good definition of librarianship, wouldn't you say, Erica? Uh, yes. So uh, you're right, make friends with your librarians and your archivists because you might just um, mention your topic and they'll go, oh, I just remember the other day seeing something about that in that collection mm -hmm. over there. And they'll, in their brain, they'll join dots in the collections that perhaps mightn't be immediately evident mm. just through catalogue searching. Um, mm. So I'm slightly getting off topic, but can I just talk about search technique? <laughs> Super critical, and we can help you with that too. <laughs> it is something librarians do love to talk about. What's that famous librarian quote that um, uh, only librarians love to search, everybody else just likes to find? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, we can help you narrow your search or broaden your search. The terms you use can really unlock things better or worse. So, um, yeah. Just, just a, an associated point to the search. And this is something I obviously haven't been on the panel for these applications, but being in universities, I deal with applications from students and other people all the time. And one of the ways to frame a question is not, I am going to prove that. The question is, I'm going to try and find out about, or mm -hmm. I'm going to ask about. And we get a lot of people who go, I'm going to get in there, and I'm going to show that this happened. And I'm not sure, is, would that be a similar thing that you find in applications as well? You know, it's, it's a quest for knowledge, it's not, it's not a court case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you, if you kind of know what the answer's going to be, like, what's the point in doing the research? <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. um, Oh, there's a few questions here which are pretty, um, you know, in terms of logistics. Um, is there information? So Christine Collins um, has asked, is there any information about the topics chosen by past successful applicants or their completed works? So if she has submitted that via Facebook, maybe we could just contribute via, uh, just respond via a link. But there is a page um, for each of the categories of past recipients. So the... Um, State Library, the John Oxley Library page goes um, from 2004 onwards, all of the recipients who've, um, who've uh, done their research project and gives an outline and, you know, the later ones as videos of, of those people as well. So that should hopefully um, give you a bit more information. Um, is there any specific format of the application form to explain details of the proposed proposal apart from the electronic form or only the electronic form um, I, th I hope Tamara doesn't kill me for this but I th we if um, we've had uh, responses from people um, using screen readers or different um, technology or um, you know people who weren't able to use the electronic form but we can find a workaround in a physical um, format um, we use Smarty Grants as a platform to manage the application and judging process. So at some point, we turn that physical application into a digital thing which travels through the system. But if you're not able to submit digitally, um, please get in contact with us to, to work out um, you know, the options. Um, I'll just run through these a little bit. Um, typically, how do, long does a fellowship research project take to finish when it's awarded. 
um, just a little bit of logistics. So we will have our award ceremony on the 6th of October. That's where we do a big announcement. And, you know, there's the, um, hopefully our minister comes and, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, a lot of um, kind of hoo-ha and it's, it's a really good kind of event where we publicly can say these names that we've been holding on to for a few weeks. Um, and then uh, from that period, we form up project agreement, which is basically just the requirements of the project that to undertake. And those requirements aren't that you will publish a book or that you will write a screenplay or that you will do anything. They're more um, things like contributing blog posts and writing uh, progress reports. So in terms of the actual requirements, there's um, there's there's and also that you. Um, there's an end of um, research presentation called Research Reveals, which I encourage you all to um, kind of look at those presentations. They're very interesting. Um, so, yeah, you uh, you can... They're normally 12 months from the when that agreement is signed, and then mm. um, you've got 12 months to kind of complete those milestones. Uh, obviously, there have been examples with, you know, COVID and flooding and all the rest where there's been a renegotiation of those timelines and that's possible but um, generally try and work to that 12 month kind of period um, there's advice on how you can best demonstrate the timeliness of a project I would just give the give timeline give, put a timeline into your um, application where you break down for the first three months, I'm going to spend it on um, doing investigation of the archive. For the next two months, I'm going to be talking um, to members of a particular community. For the next two months, I'm going to be trying to synthesise that and write that into something. Mm. You know, so it's like you've given thought about the components of things that you'll need to do for the project and you've inscribed some time. We don't need to see a Gantt chart or anything like that. <laughs> But um, if you, it's just a demonstration that you've given thought of to what do I need to do and what's, how much time do I need to allocate to each of those steps. Was the question asking about specifically timelines or about how do you demonstrate the timeliness of a research project? Oh, that's a, I'm, that's you're a, right, I might have misread that. No, 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 I, just, I, yeah, think yeah. Could be either. I think I'd just like to throw it, because that's a really big thing mm. <laughs> for research applications, mm. is how do you demonstrate the timeliness? And I guess I could use it, you could mm. say this, you can pay an application in that says that I want to look at, you know, the holdings of, you know, consolidated press from 1890 to 1960. It's going to be a great contribution to knowledge. And it's like, it probably is, but it doesn't seem particularly timely. Well, I imagine the project about women in the Great Barrier Reef, I can see how that is an incredibly timely project, right? Mm. Because it speaks to contemporary concerns. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's bringing this knowledge, which is very relevant to public debates right now, you know? So how do you connect your project to a contemporary debate to contemporary issues and make it seem not just like you know what it really is which is you really wanting to just go and spend a lot of time looking at something that you're interested in but how do you dress it up so that it seems like something that is actually very timely and is really going to contribute to public discussion and debate mm. if that makes sense it's that impact kind of question impact yeah. Yeah. What, i hate that word yeah but yeah sorry to use it um impact I, and engagement maybe yeah. the least favorite <laughs> Okay, uh, we've got one more question left on the on the channel. We'll probably wrap it up after that. Um, I might get you to answer that one, Robin. It is, if you have contributed to the collection and it relates to your research idea, should you reference your contribution? Well, or bury it deep down inside? <laughs> <laughs> no, you should reference it because if it's in the collection, we, we, we want it acknowledged. We want it cited as something you've, you've consulted. Not that, that's sort of factored into the argument you're making, the pitch you're making, and the research you're doing. So uh, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, it might mightn't have, it might already be in the collection, or it might be intended to be in the collection. Either is fine. Thank can, you. Can I ask? Can I yeah, just add one absolutely. one more point? I guess um, one thing that I was a little worried about. Um, and I think you were too, Kerry, when we made our application, was that the women we were after wouldn't be in the collection, right? So if you've got an idea and you're afraid that they're going to be absent from the collection, like how do we frame an application around the absence of these women's history mm -hmm. in a place where we thought it really belonged? Um, and I think for us, it, um, talking to the library staff was, was crucial in crafting our application, but also having a very strong methodology, like a, we could really map out 
what kind of methods we would apply mm. if we if we didn't find what we were looking for. Okay, we'd go back out and we'd perhaps go to another library or to a place that we did know there were records of that particular mm. topic, and then we could look, go back into the library and this kind of go look for it here again and go out mm. and in. So I guess yeah, not. Not to let that, if, if anybody has that hesitation, don't let it stop you, I think. Just come in and have a conversation and then start crafting, I think, uh, an application around how you will tackle that problem in Dem your fellowship. Yeah. Demonstrating the absence of something in our collection can be just as useful as demonstrating the presence because if there's an absence, then that's a problem. Then maybe your project is the thing that solves that issue. So that's actually sometimes a really strong selling point. Um, and citing resources in other institutions and collections uh, is absolutely fine too, but the real basis of, of your research needs to be centred on our collection. And of, of course, if you've found other material in other collections worth mentioning, then that should be included as well. Mm. Uh, one late question about who makes the final decision with respect to the award recipients? Does the minister sign off on those chosen? Mm. Um, it's a fair question. Um, the, we, basically, we do a selection report, which um, the panel give a recommendation, and that's signed off by the State Librarian and Chief Executive Officer of the State Library. Um, we, a lot of the fellowships are, the money that goes towards the bursary is from money's raised with um, benefactors so um, it's not like a grant where uh, say a minister needs to be is, is involved a lot of the time the money is um, we are spending on via a, a generous donation from um, a member of the public so um, I, and I'll give some acknowledgements of those soon uh, I probably just want to give a quick rundown of uh, uh, I assume everybody is aware of the different categories of fellowships, but just to be really clear that, you know, we have all of these opportunities available, that we have the John Oxley Library F Fellowship, which is a general Queensland kind of history fellowship, the Monica Clare Research Fellowship, which is the third year that we will be running this. So Do Dr Fiona Foley was the initial um, recipient of that, and then Rachel West Captain has been the second recipient of that. It's to look at Queensland's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history, and it's it's a unidentified um, fellowship. So somebody needs to be Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander background to undertake that research, and that's to really look um, from a First Nations-led perspective of, um, you know, we have a collection called the John Oxley Library Collection. You know, how do we redress that balance? Um, we also have the, Mon the Middlehauser Scholar in Residence, um, uh, which is about supporting, we call it GLAM, but it's galleries, libraries, archives and museum thinkers to develop new tools, resources and strategies for the sector. Mm. There's a Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame Fellowship, which is about looking at um, the Queensland's uh, business history and economic history. And I probably don't, you don't need to, it's not, accountants can apply but it's not just for accountants or you know like people in you know um, people have looked at the history of fashion you know in Queensland have looked at Greek cafes was a business leaders hall of fame oh, fellowship so you can think fairly broadly about that topic um, we also have the Letty Katz fellowship it's often every two years so this is like you know kind of it's not like the Olympics it's more frequent than the Olympics but it, it's it's that year where the Letty Katz fellowship is open and we also have the Christina Bowden um, Fellowship, which is the first year of offering that. So we're really trying to give that a push. We hope to have possibly, um, you know, uh, some winners to announce on the sixth of October. But um, stay tuned to all of the social media channels. The Queensland Memory Awards homepage is a really good place to go to for your first reference point. And also, um, there's contact details there if you have any further questions. That's probably all the questions for today. Um, I'd like to really thank our um, speakers and for being so generous with their time and knowledge and experience and thank Robin, John, Deb and Mark for their participation. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming out on a cold, <laughs> on a cold Wednesday and um, on Origin Night as well. Like, you know, we, 
um, I work in the cultural sector and sometimes, you know, rugby league scheduling, you know, we forget about. So. <laughs> um, uh, I'd also like to just reinforce applications close 15th of July. So that's, that's your drop dead date. The application form is through Smarty Grants and the, um, if you need any assistance and how to apply through that platform, it's, you know, you create an account and go through that. It's easier than MyGov or anything like that. Um, <laughs> the recording of this event will be available um, in the coming days through the State Library's um, website. And I think if you've been registered through Eventbrite, I think you'll get a, you, we'll, we'll send a, an email out reminding you. Um, I'd also just like to thank those people who make these fellowships possible. Dr. Catherine Middlehauser, who supports the Middlehauser Scholar in Residence, the Siganto Foundation, who have come on board to support the Monica Clare um, Research Fellowship, the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame Fellowship, which is a collaboration with um, Queensland University of Technology, um, the Bowgen family, who have supported the Christina Bowgen um, Fellowship, and also the Malik family, who have supported the Letty Katz uh, Fellowship for the last um, few years. Um, so all of those uh, donations um, are made possible through the Queensland Library Foundation, which is an arm of State Library which um, supports the work that we do day to day and without their assistance these kind of projects just wouldn't be possible. So um, you can contribute and you can assist the cause um, through the Queensland Library Foundation. Um, donations above $2 are tax deductible, I hear. Um, <laughs> So uh, yeah, that's, that's um, really pleasing to see that we've been able to grow the offer of fellowships available through that philanthropic support. Um, that's probably enough talking, enough information for everyone to absorb. Um, I'd just like to thank you again very much for turning out. I'd like to thank our panel and I'd like to acknowledge all the people online tuning in. Thank you very much, have a good night.